So good morning still. Um, I hope you still can enjoy this part of the session because we're going to continue on the vesicles. Um, and last week, uh, Sean and I quickly sent some emails to at least not have an overlap. And uh, well, you already did a good job to introduce to you all these vesicle types and, uh, and issues. Um, but I also had this horrible title um, just to give where do we stand now with diagnosis and therapeutics, which is, of course, so broad because you already saw from Sean that the literature is, is booming and expanding. Everybody wants to jump on the vesicles and exosomes because, well, it's a new, well, cell therapeutics, let's put it that way, like 50 years ago. And so what I thought I, I will incorporate literature, but also will take back to my own research lines and to take you along what we went through and all the issues we went into as well. Uh, and so maybe if you have questions and, and, and things uh, afterwards, just ask me because I will be open, as says Sean, that this field is still open for a lot of problems uh, and, and to, to be solved. Um, let's see how this works. Yes, so nothing to declare here. Um, so Sean already referred to, to a position paper that you've written here from the EEC with a lot of staff members and faculty members here as well uh, um, included just to get this field also in our cardiovascular area um, well better defined or better uh, organized for reproducibility. And what I will do today is, is get into the different topics that we have highlighted over there. Uh, and of course, we'll go in, into the diagnostic part and on the therapeutic part, as also Sean was mentioning it for the reperfusion part, but we'll go a little bit more on the regenerative part. This is a slide I would like to explain a little bit because I will go back to this one a, a lot of times. Um, so my lab and, and, and our research teams are focusing on the ischemic myocardium. If you look over here, you have the heart and upon, well, Ischemia, of course, there is a lot of cell death. Um, and in the first part of my talk, I will focus a little bit on the diagnosis of uh, this acute myocardial infarction and how we can use vesicles or at least vesicle preparations to do that. And in the second part, I will go uh, into the, this part of the scheme where usually, well, the adult setting, if you have a, a big ischemic event, will go into contractile dysfunction with a lot of fibrosis and remodeling of the myocardium. And what we aimed for many years already with stem cells is to get back into this neonatal status where we can repair basically this organ. Um, and well, probably uh, Thomas will highlight later on that we completely failed so far in that area, but at least we, we learned a lot of, of those kind of approaches also that we can maybe implement in the physical field. So first on the diagnostic part. Um, so the acute MI uh, um, in, in, in uh, the clinics is a relatively easy diagnosed issue if you are a patient that has an, an, uh, an eye for uh, longer than a few hours. Um, and this scheme over here uh, represents basically here the moment that the patient experienced the infarct, and this is a timeline where in the end, if you have a lot of damage, it's easy to recognize. That's what I meant with the, the first sentence. So functional parameters, markers are easily measured by ECG. Um, even the troponins or other biomarkers are available in a clinical setting to diagnose in, 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 in a sense that if there are cell necrosis, intercellular proteins are released, so you can measure that. But there's still a huge need for early detection. And that part is still, well, underdeveloped in that sense, or a lot of people are focusing on. And I will show you that maybe these vesicles or these vesicle release uh, attempts can be a way to do that because of this big pool of biomarkers that is available there. Um, Sean already showed a lot of the contaminations that are in there, but it's also really difficult to get specific markers from this early set because a lot of things are happening, of course, if a patient suddenly experiences such a stress. Um, what we did is we, we set up an, an, an experiment um, where we used our clinical colleagues uh, from an, an, a peripheral hospital close by to the UNC in, in Utrecht. And what they uh, basically did is they included uh, almost 500 patients that just entered the regular uh, emergency room. So they have chest pain, the regular complaints for acute coronary syndrome, which is indication for myocardial infarction. But of course, also a lot of negative uh, uh, outcome patients will come there. So a lot of people having the complaints, not having the myocardial infarction. And that went into the regular, uh, well, uh, process in this hospital on the left side. So regular diagnosis, regular cardiology team looked at it. But we were lucky to have like a an, an, uh, sample of the first moment these people entered the hospital. So we took uh, serum from that, we did RNA isolations, and we detected whether we could do de some detection of early biomarkers. And at that time, we were also very interested in microRNAs. And what we did, basically, we set up a panel, which is uh, uh, the, well a way to, to um, start detecting these type of things in an early uh, phase. Um, you can do, of course, proteomics or microarrays, but in these patient samples, usually it's, it's really difficult to get a, a good idea which microarrays you have to take or which 
proteins you have to take. So we selected a few microarrays that were published, and we also had some experience that we uh, thought this is something that, that's, well, induced or released from, from an uh, ischemic heart. So we selected three microarrays where our muscle enriched and uh, a two that are uh, in, in fibrotic or immune response related uh, processes. And you will see in the next slide that we were kind of lucky selecting these five. So you can do open approaches, and this was like a, a, a candidate-based approach based on literature and our experience, and sometimes that works, to be honest. And this is what we get. So we get um, two populations of patients, of course, non-ACS and ACS, so having the event in the end or not having the event. Um, and we looked at these five, well, micronas, and you could see that all of them could predict that these patients would experience or were having this myocardial infarction at the moment they presented themselves at the emergency room. Um, having met some clinicians here in the room, they probably said, okay, but troponin can be used for this as well, uh, because in this setup, the, we excluded the people having ST elevations, so the clear uh, ECG changes. So if we exclude the troponin from this population, these microns could still do their job in the sense of, of being a prognostic marker for having a myocardial infarction. So this suggests this, this is a good thing. Um, of course, then, in the clinics, we use a lot of, of uh, uh, models to predict how patients are diagnosed or not. And for instance, the clinical model is already a, a, a thing to really predict, in this case, 72% of the cases for micro infarction. And a clinical model means, okay, what's the age, what's the BMI, what are blood levels uh, for different uh, proteins and, and, and markers. Um, and what we did, we basically made this bottle not only on the clinical model, but we added the troponins, and you can see that this uh, area under the curve, which is a prediction for the, uh, uh, well, clear indication of this patient is, is becoming a uh, myocardial infarctive patient. And by adding several of the markers, in the end, we were even able to predict almost 95% of these patients, at least in this cohort, which I think is really promising. And it says as well that not only the clinical model and the really golden standard of troponin can predict a really high level, but there is still something to gain. Um, but I'm a more basic scientist, so this is great, and this is biomarkers, but also interested how does this work and, and uh, where does it come from. And then I was thinking about um, this, this attempt, um, because troponins, for instance, that we use in these kind of models and in these patient categories is just released because of necrosis of cells. And of course, you have to think about these microRNAs, um, and we can easily detect them because there's an amplification step in there, and it's not like an ELISA-based method that you can detect a protein that's just rising because of the release. Um, we thought, is this something that's specifically released because of the necrosis, or is it an active process? Because if it's an active process and you can understand that, then there's maybe more to gain there in that area, because if cells experience ischemia, maybe even earlier, and you can fish out those kind of compartments, then it's you have a diagnosis way earlier than actually the, the, the late stage of cell death. And that's illustrated in this figure where, well, micronates can be released and maybe it's stabilized or are more packed into microvesicles or exosomes or even maybe HL particles that are around there. So, of course, patient material is really, well, hard to get and also the amount of sample that you can use for these kind of studies uh, in, in a basic lab is, is limited. So we, we moved away from the patient. We went into a more established model that we have for large animals here in the porcine model. And basically what we did, we mimicked the ischemic event by a an, an, an temporary occlusion, in this case of the L6, and we used like 60 minutes. And we could take several time points, uh, blood, and, and, and we can detect then these type of microRNAs and, and troponins in the blood. Um, one statement I'm going to make here already, um, for patient samples for biomarkers, uh, um, we use here ExoQuick, which was already mentioned like a crap quick or a crappy way of, of isolating vesicle types, or but at least it's a precipitation method that's easily used in a clinical setting. So that's the good thing of that. But of course, in the end, you don't know what you precipitate, which is a bad thing. Um, and if you think uh, as a patient or a clinician, I would say, well, who cares? If it brings a biomarker on the field that can help, that's good. But from a biology point of view, be careful there. So that's, that's one remark I want to make there. But of course, we continued because in a clinical setting, it's difficult to use this, this advanced isolation methods, as Sean has already mentioned, and I'll also show you later on as well. So if we do this, um, if you look at the uh, relative protein we isolate here, it always goes up. And of course, you can say, well, these are vesicles, but there's also probably the release of the, the different cholesterol particles. There's a lot of response happening there. But the good thing what we saw, if we look now at the different microRNAs that were in this preparation, the fault increases are, are massively. Um, so if I go back to 
this slide, these were like 10, 15 fold increases, which is, which is fine, which is great. But if you look at these kind of precipitation methods, I'm not claiming it's a good precipitation method, but it shows that the enrichments of these microarrays are in the hundred folds and thousand folds, which makes it a, a sensitive marker. Of course, we have to reproduce this and we have to get better isolation methods to get more specific, but it gives the potential here. And also, if you look at and, and, and PCR data, because that's usually how you quantify these, these microRNAs, and it's still a technique that has to further develop in a clinical setting to be fast enough to, to diagnose these patients. You can see that usually it's really, really low expression levels. 40 cycles, if you are in the PCR field, you understand that's kind of the, well, the maximum you can get. It's kind of homopoietic ranges of, of things you can detect. Um, but these dashed lines are the ones that we got from these precipitation methods. So going really to well, 30 cycles, and that's kind of reasonable detectable. So we're getting in ranges that uh, I think it's, it's a way to translate it forward. Um, but of course we were into this, okay, uh, this seems to be a little bit more on a precipitated vesicle type. Can we do better? Um, and what we did basically with the same model, we used these ultracertification steps, like uh, Sean already mentioned. You use different steps to get rid of cell debris, to get rid of the larger particles, and you go smaller and smaller into the vesicles. And what we did, we, we then checked indeed with EM to see if, if we have vesicle-like uh, uh, isolation methods. And yes, we also saw, still saw some lipoproteins, so there are contaminations in there. Um, and what we did as well is we used this technique that, that Sean mentioned, that we used these lipid dyes to stain then those vesicles we isolated from these preparations. And we, we brought them on endothelial cells, in this case is again uh, uh, HMAC cells, so human microvascular endothelial cells. And by just exposing these vesicles or these preparations from, from our porcine animals, we show that, that these endothelial cells were taking up these vesicle preps. Um, of course, could be still contaminations, as Sean was mentioning, so we always be careful there what, what's happening. Um, so this is just an initial uptake experiment, and if you wait long enough, you will see always these uptakes, to be honest, because, um, of course, we're, we're looking into these directions where vesicles have a function, because biomarker in general is not, is, is not a thing for nature. Of course, they are released for a reason, and, and that's why we try to understand it. Can we isolate these vesicles, and what do they do? Do they signal? Do they activate things? And that's why also this, this last part here in this experiment um, uh, was for me a little it is convincing that isolating these preps from different time points, you could compare as well than the contamination. So everything that's different there, that has to do something with your injury. So if we uh, use these scratch assays that also that, that uh, Sean was mentioning, so you have a monolayer of cells, you scratch away uh, simply with, with, with a little pipette or a tip, uh, you can activate endothelial cells and you see if you add ingredients like the vesicle preps or, or the uh, exoquick preps, uh, what happens there. So this is again this uh, ultra certification isolation method. Before the injury, at the moment is ischemia and post perfusion, and we clearly see that there's an activation of these endothelial cells, suggesting that it's not only uptake, but also there's an activation of these endothelial cells. And maybe, and now I'm dreaming, of course, again, it's, it's a signal that's in the heart active to activate there the endothelial cells to get a better perfusion again, because that's the issue there. Well, of course, that's a little dream that I cannot show you yet. Um, and then this last part, because, of course, there's still serum, there are platelets in there, there's a lot of issues of, of isolating these vesicles. We also put uh, our uh, small hearts of mice, in this case, on a long enough perfusion system. So we get rid of all the serum and, and the blood components. And we did exactly the same experiment. So we ligated again this, this artery on the Langendorf system, and then we isolated everything that get from the perfusion system uh, via our uh, ultracentrification steps. And then we could still see this activation signal. So apparently something is released from the heart in a vesicle prep that activates endothelial cells, suggesting these this approaches. Um, Briefly already discussed by Sean is that there, of course, are different populations of vesicles released. We have the exosomes, we have the uh, microvesicles, we even have like apoptotic bodies that are released. So based on this, we, we're not able to distinguish that. Um, and of course, if you think about different subpopulations on a different origin, you can also even think about different subpopulations of vesicles that people claim that can home to different cell types. So it's like a homing of cell specificity there. Um, so this is on endothelial cells, and that's why I brought as well this example of, of uh, this year from a group working on, on vesicles from, from post uh, uh tissue where they also saw the same microRNAs really released in circulation, uh, and, and, and uh, acute myocardial infarction. Also looked where these days microRNAs go. 
and they checked the different tissues and, and what they saw is that in, in, in bone marrow cells and, and, and some in kidney there is a release or an increase of these micronase presence as well and some other organs are not there and if they carefully look further they even saw that, that the bone marrow is strongly enriched and it was of course a trick or a, a, for, for further studies and what they did they isolated in these ultra centrifugation steps these vesicles from these uh, uh, animals and they used it again in the vitro setups. And what they saw is basically that they could reduce the connection, uh, sorry, the CXCR4 levels in bone marrow cells. And their hypothesis, and there's a lot of data in there, so please go to the paper if you're really interested there, is what they saw is that the infarcts can release these vesicles, as I showed you from our data sets, and that these vesicles really home into the bone marrow. There is some, some uh, follow-up experiments there where the CXCR4 is, is downregulated, and thereby there is a an, an, an release of bone marrow-derived cells and they home back to the infarctate areas where the neut well, neutrophils or the monocular cells enter, of course, to well, remove all the debris and, and the uh, fading cells. So I think it's really promising that these type of studies start to appear now that really zooming into these details. Uh, but later on, I'll also show you that there are some, some drawbacks of this kind of, of setups. Um, going back as well to one of our own studies and where we use the mice again, where we did the ischemic perfusion model with this ultrasoundification steps for isolating the vesicles, because we also were interested, is there only this exosome population there, or are there other populations there? And together with the group of Marka Waub on the uh, University of Utrecht, they have this uh, BD influx flow cytometer on a really sensitive way you can detect individual uh, axillary vesicles. So what we did, basically, we isolated this with ultrasoundification, with this the sucrose gradient, as what Sian already mentioned. So the vesicles start to float there, and they were labeled with this lipid dye. So there's an extra step in there with the sucrose gradient that you separate it from, well, the uh, HDL populations, or at least a little bit better uh, separations there from the furry dyes, and then you can do the individual uh, measurements. But also this measurement that you can see on the left bottom, which is a regular fax, but a really high sensitive fax, in the summer months, it doesn't work. You have to do that in, in winter time because of the sensitivity. So those kind of drawbacks you also f experience in this field. You are s on the so low scale that technically we're, we're challenging machines. So of course these machines are better and they will be developed. The lasers will be better. We have to wait until winter again to reproduce these kind of data sets. Um, this is the quantification of that and that's basically why, why I brought it. Um, on the bottom you can see here this kind of an, an exosomal enriched marker with densities that are familiar uh, with, with the exosomes. And this graph over here shows the different densities that we got from the sucrose gradient. And although in this range we expect the exosomes, you see that the increase in the ischemic perfusion part is everywhere. Meaning that it's not only in exosomal-like populations, but also the microvesicles and also these apoptotic bodies are released, having their functional things why they were released. Of course, part of, of, of apoptotic bodies probably is just to release all the contaminants and, and, and degraded uh, organelles in there, but maybe they also have signal in there, and that's usually more in this range of, of these vesicle types. So there's still a lot of things to discover, I think, uh, on this part. Um, and this is a slide I already used for many years. If I if you have lectures to PhD students or master students, uh, there are so many examples out there how to use microvesicles and, and all different populations, not only acute MI, as I just showed to you, but also in hypertension and, and, and heart failure. And, so if you're interested in that area, please dig into that uh, and, and, and go with this kind of lessons I've showed you a little bit and, and read these position papers we have, have published because there is still a lot to do. And that's also highlighted in, in some of the technical limitations I, I brought here uh, that's in those papers that we don't have golden standards in this field. And it's really based on, on lab experience, how isolation procedures go and, and, and if they're critical enough to look at the details there. Um, and of course, then also things like the unknown influence on the confounding factors already mentioned, or things like uh, the additional value of the EV markers on the golden standard. So that's why I brought the troponin on, with the micro on top of that. There is some gain to get there, but we still have to be careful because in the clinics, there's a lot of things already available. Um, this one I will, will skip, just go to the paper if you're interested. So what are the future perspectives on how to develop this further? Uh, I think it's linked to all the critical notes you will hear today. So to go to the next phase, a little bit also the area where we're, we're actively uh, involved, is how to bring these vesicle types into more therapeutic range. Um, and it comes from, of course, the cellular therapeutics. We will hear much more from Thomas Eschenhagen in the next lecture how, how this field is, is uh, uh, developing. And this should be a movie. It's not running now. Oh, 
don't care. Um, and the regenerative therapy was started, what is it, like 18, 19 years ago with, with some first publications where injecting cells led to a an, an, an beneficial effect on the heart. Um, and since then, there are many, many, well, exciting areas were explored, I think. Um, and if you go to this overview, brings, I think, a little summary of, of how cell therapeutic evolved is that, that a lot of first generation cells were like the easy cells, bone marrow cells, mesenchymal stromal cells. Cells, as Sean already mentioned, have some paracrine effects if you bring them into, into the, the heart. Uh, has been seen uh, even into a clinical phase. Although the effect sizes are really limited, we see something. Um, then we have the second generation of cells, which is partly uh, evolved from the cardiac-derived stem cells or progenitor cells, although a lot of people claim they are not there or they don't exist. Or This is also a debate, I think, in the field that, that we need um, because this field claims a lot that we cannot repair the heart in an easy way, but it's not that so easy. And it also brings us to the third generation, but I think Thomas will mention a lot on, on how to use cells and, and contractile cells with engineering and how to bring that forward. Um, and also brings me to, to, to this conclusion slide where initially we said, well, transplanted cells will be brought into the uh, organ forming the new vessels or forming this healthy myocardium. But, well, I think we all agree now that basically what these cells did so far is it is a paracrine stimulus. So they affect the endogenous heart, the endogenous cells there, um, but they didn't really contribute in a contractile well. They didn't integrate. It's really difficult to, to trace them back. Um, and many, oh, sorry, so, these are two cell types. I will come back many times, so that's why I briefly mentioned to you the domestic animal stromal cells. So cells come from the bone marrow. Uh, you isolate bone marrow, you plate them on plastics, and these are the cells they attach if you culture them long enough. It's a stromal cell that can have uh, different uh, differentiation capacities. They can differentiate the different lineages. In our hands, never towards the cardiomyocytes, to be honest. But they have a lot of paracrine effects, uh, immune modulatory effects, cardioprotective effects. And we have a cell type that, uh, well, we isolate from the fetal and the adult hearts, which we call the cardiac progenitor cell. Um, and we can differentiate those in, in a really difficult protocol with, with harsh environmental stimuli into at least cardiomyocytes. But also from our results so far, we see that these cells injected in the heart as well has only paracrine effects. So that's why we use those two, at least two, to study that. I think it was one of the first stories in our laboratory by uh, Leo Timmers and Fatih Arslan and Dominic de Klein uh, heading that, where conditioned medium from these cells were injected instead of the stem cells. This is again this, this model I showed to you. We, this is a PORSA model of ischemia reperfusion, and, and uh, in this case we infused or saline, so no control cells there in that time. But of course, a lot of people are doing that now to see that there's actually an effect of the cell specific, uh, the specific cell types. In this case, they used conditioned medium after 24 hours uh, on top of these cells. And what they saw is basically here you see the whitening of the tissue is gone meaning there is less infarcted tissue. So maybe it's kind of cardioprotective, as, as Sean was mentioning, for, for other things. You can quantify that, and, and well, infarct size uh, of left ventricle area or the area at risk both dramatically dropped. Of course, a lot of people have seen that before, um, but I think this part is the most important part of this slide, is where they try to identify which compartment in this condition medium did this job. And what they did is, of course, this is the infarcted area again with the saline group, so the PBS injection, condition medium, and then they start fractionating what is in the medium that causes this effect. Uh, they did, in this case, a an, 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 an less relevant cell type, and HEC293, I think every lab here has that. It's an easy cell, easy transectable, they also do a lot of things, but it shouldn't be cardioprotective, at least in this sense, otherwise we could all use these type of cells. And by fractionating, like, uh, be, be below and above the 1,000 kilo delta, you could clearly see that there was a well, the department in that conditioned medium that was above 1,000 kilo delta that causes this effect. And that was a little bit of a surprise because we know that a lot of growth factors and proteins are in this fraction, just the lower parts. So we're kind of surprised that it was this, this larger uh, effect. And based on uh, HPLC and sex separation, as Sean mentioned before, it was shown as over here, they could really identify vesicles in this medium showing that actually those did the job over here. It's not a growth factor or a combination of growth factors, but it's actually something that's in a vesicle or attached to that in this setup of experiments. And a lot of people, of course, follow that up, and this is a great work for a few years back where they showed that also from the second generation of cell types, this is again a progenitor from the heart, you can see that, that uh, infarct sizes are reduced in, in the acute setting, and this again, uh, uh, the 
large animal model, the porcine model, but also in a chronic setting, infusing these kind of vesicles could reduce the transmissibility of the infarct and reduce uh, thereby scar size. So not only in the acute setting, but also later on, and this is after, uh, if I can remember correctly, after two weeks infusing these vesicles, there are beneficial effects to be seen. But as we know from a lot of fields, it's of course, uh, the first are always the best ones and a lot of people start to reproduce and I will come back later on, but some issues I think we will run into uh, by translating this again to uh, clinical ther therapies. I'm um, going back a little bit on, on, is this essential EVs from, from these cells? Um, of course, if you start using conditioned medium, that's, that's one, show, one way to show it. This is a nice uh, study by Ibrahim a few years back where they also induced uh, the progenitors from the heart and also used the fibroblast cell line to show that infarct sizes are uh, stable if you use a an, 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 an less convenient cell, uh, but they are normalized again if you use these progenitor cells. And what they also use is they use this inhibitor, which is a an, an, an non-competitive inhibitor of the ENDS mass, who, who basically is involved in, in releasing vesicles from cells. If you use these inhibitors in these cells, basically they could block the effect suggesting that there is some vesicle release important here. And of course, um, if, if you're really into the biology and biogenesis of vesicles, you know they do much more than only blocking EV release. So this is still a critical part. Um, together with Marisha Gamans and Leiden, we also did a little bit more specific. So we tried to knock down a few of the proteins that are involved in the, in the release and the biogenesis of these uh, EVs, uh, ROP27A and B. And by doing a knockdown of these 27A uh, and we take these cells, this is a regular progenitor of the heart injecting, you see a reduction in infarct size, but removing this production machinery, you also have some data that, that uh, in this publication where you can see that actually the vesicle production is lowered. If you infuse that into these animals, after 48 hours you see that infarct size reduction is, is, is limited, suggesting all these things that, that these vesicles are basically the ones capable of doing the, the, the cell therapeutic effects that we saw so far. Also, really recently, already meta-analysis up here. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, well, you should be critical on meta-analysis, what to conclude for it, but at least gives us uh, some insights and views on, on what's going on in the field. And they use this setup to screen what, what's happening with vesicles in, in, in different animal models. And in the end, they included like 24, 25 papers showing that using vesicles, well, gives an overall effect size of, of a 12 to 30 percent ejection fraction increase. So suggesting that a lot of people see similar effects. Um, but to be critical, we all saw the same things with the cells. Um, and we know that translating that to the clinical studies, we, we run in issues in larger animal models, and if you go to patients, the effect sizes are really marginal. Um, so we should be cri critical, I think, there. Um, then go a little bit more to our uh, own work where the CPCs uh, have been used, so they are progenitors from the heart. and. The good thing of that is, of course, we can culture them and we can propagate them for, for a year or one and a half years in, 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 in culture. We can generate a lot of cells because if you want to study extra vesicles, I'm not sure if Sean really mentioned it already, but you need a lot of culture flasks. You need a lot of time, a lot of media uh, and big incubators. Um, the people here in the EDR yeah, is doing that, uh, even for my lab, uh, so Monica Roofs uh, here, she has like hundreds of flasks to do one experiment. So not to get you out of this topic, because I think it's really interesting, but be aware it's really laborious. But having these cells that you can propagate, you can also define the medium there, so get rid of serum and, and well, contaminations of vesicles, and then try to isolate these vesicles based on all the identification steps or the sacrose gradients I mentioned before. And that's what we did as well for this uh, cell type and as well for the magic animal stromal cells. If you compare that, that's what Sean's already mentioning, we see that these vesicle populations of around 100 nanometer in size are there. And if you look at the different markers, like the flotolins or the CD9s or the CD63s, uh, they're all there. And also on the densities that you expect for, for exosomal markers. Um, but also this definition of what's an exosome, what's an exosomal vesicles is still a debate, I think, in the field. We all try to explain how these are exosomal vesicles. And exosomes are a typical population, but you can only say something when it's an exosome if you really know that it's produced from the internal pathways, as Sean was mentioning, with the multifuscular bodies. So be careful with how you use these definitions. Um, if you think about the cells and what they can do in the heart, and now think about these vesicles, I will highlight a few items here. So injecting that into an acute or more chronic phase uh, after an injury, they, of course, have an influence on the cardiomyocyte apoptosis or necrosis, that's the, the reperfusion part, as, as uh, Sean was mentioning, but also other later effects can be seen. And one of the first, uh, I think, 
nicely shown uh, data on, 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 on a mechanism how apoptosis can be influenced it was recently published here by uh, Beryl, uh, um, where they use these kind of vesicles from both bone marrow cells as these progenitor cells from the heart, so first, second generation to compare that. And they saw that basically on, on in the acute moments where, in fact, uh, sorry, injection fractions are, are compared, that even fibroblasts, they have some effect, but in the long run, if you wait long enough, they equal a little bit the PBS injections. So in the acute setting, it doesn't, do what, it doesn't matter what you inject in the heart, there is some effect seen. If you wait long enough, you see, well, better what you, you may be interested in. And we usually are interested more in the long-term effects. And if you compare then the bone marrow and the CPCs, there is a difference there. And they use that difference to see, okay, there should be a difference then also on content. And they did a proteomics approach. And what they saw is that different populations of, of uh, the proteome was, was changed between this CPCs and the bone marrow. And they identified this PAPA uh, protein, which is on the, uh, the outside of the vesicles. And this is a proteolytic uh, uh, enzyme which can cleave basically a, a protective part on the IGF that is present around in, in your tissues. And thereby it activates the IGF signaling and thereby reducing this, this apoptotic pathway in the cells. I think this is one of the first that actually, for me, at least pr promising showed that you can study these mechanisms because it's really difficult. And we'll get to that later as well, that if you start to manipulate the, the, the proteins, or sorry, the vesicles, that you also manipulate more than only your target proteins. Um, going back to, to a second part, it's on, on, on uh, increasing vessel density. That's what my lab was uh, focusing on uh, last year. So if we isolate our vesicles from these progenitors and we expose them again to our, our uh, uh, endothelial cell layers that we have in culture, we use the HMAX and UVEX usually, that we saw surprisingly that only this part of our sucrose gradient was able to transfer the dye to our target cells in culture. And that the other population, although we know that there are vesicles there, and maybe not seen here with the flotillin markers, but you see it a little bit, we're not able to transfer the dye. Maybe that's specific, maybe not, but at least give some, some insights. There is some specificity here on the different vesicle populations that are released from, from these cell types. Uh, and we were uh, interested here in uh, EMPRIN, which is uh, standing for Excellent Matrix Metalloproteinase Inducer. And we know that from the oncology field where emperin is uh, present on uh, tumor cells and uh, by uh, being present, it can activate fibroblasts in its environment by releasing the proteases like the MMPs and the NMs, and thereby will uh, facilitate the, the, the migrative behavior of cells and also even get tumor cell invasion uh, enhancement. And we saw already that on the exosomes, this emperin and also the MMPs are massively present. So we thought, okay, maybe that's an entrance for our uh, uh, well, migrative uh, effects we have seen before. So we used our regular cells and we used an, an, an sRNA approach to knock down emperin. And also we had antibodies that can basically block the emperin. And what we saw is if you use these endothelial activation assays or uh, the scratch or spheroids or mitogel assays, also explained by, by Shah, you could see that our exosomes from our progenitor cells could always enhance these assays. And by removing the emperin, you can clearly, I think, see that, that these, these assays are reduced, or the activation status of these endothelial cells is reduced, suggesting this is a way that, that the endothelial cells can be activated by our progenitors. And uh, one thing I didn't mention so far, what, what I think is a consensus in the field, that if you inject cells for therapeutics of the heart, basically what we see usually is or cardiac protection of cardiomyocytes or vessel induction, that we see more vessels happening. So that's the reason why we, we focus on this area. Um, we also went into matrigel plug assays, so subcutaneous placement of matrigel in, in, uh, in uh, the belly of mice, and uh, basically it brings an invasion of monoclear cells and also brings in more uh, endothelial formation there, vessel formation. And by doing that for our control exosomes, you can see that there is a massive induction of influx, and by using these knockouts of emperin, you can see that it's massively reduced, even if you think about the larger vessels that we can quantify. One thing we learned here, for instance, is that vesicles don't stay in this matrigel. They're released. So, of course, if you think about animals that you use and you want to use a plug, um, of course you want to use multiple plugs in one animal. And that's what we did. So we used control plugs and we used plugs with vesicles in there with different dosages. But when we compared the empty plugs without exosomes to regular mice that only had the empty plugs, the plugs that were inside of a body with plugs having EVs also have an increased induction of, of uh, monocular cells. So suggesting that vesicles are released from these materials into a circulatory aspect, or at least in the area, thereby inducing uh, these, these effect sizes. So be careful by, by just, well, reducing animal numbers and think this is an easy way. Uh, we now just have one plug per animal, and we have a lot of animals to, to study our effects. 
So what we have seen uh, so far, at least in, in our field, and it's really difficult to get to mechanistic parts, and we'll highlight to you there, is that in the normal progression upon a th in treatment with, sorry, treatment of a myocardial infarction, we see the regular aspects like fibrosis, remodeling, and, and, and cell death. Uh, and by using the cells or the EV in treatments, we could see already like more cardiomyocytes, the densities could be increased, um, but indeed like inflammation and scar formation that's suggested, but not a lot of people show that so far. And we tried a little bit in in vitro setups here for fibrosis, but it was really difficult to reproduce whether vesicles could do that. Um, and our idea here is, is if you do an, an acute activity of cells, so uh, for instance, an, 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 an uh, protective of cell death in cardiomyocytes, that's an acute effect activating endothelial cells, that's an acute effect, but fibrosis is a long-term effect. Inflammation is a long-term effect, so just a single dose doing that is really difficult. And of course, we tried multiple doses, but it's, it's difficult to, to show effects like that and definitely going into to mechanistic uh, effects uh, here as well. For instance, we published here on the T cells that vesicles can definitely influence T cell behavior in culture dishes. We did proteomics and we did the micro analysis. We identified several components, but in the end, we were not able to well, tune the vesicles and thereby show the mechanistic insights uh, how this works. So um, still a lot of work to, to be done, I think. Um, but in the meantime, also the field moves forward, and this is work from uh, Manachet from Paris, where uh, he is using an, an, an IPS-derived progenitor cell and brings that into a patch, and thereby shows well effects in, in patients. So these are approaches. This, this is a surgeon, really brings into well patients that have a, a big problem, it's heart failure, and bringing this patches in there, and he sees some beneficial effects and, and suggests this is coming from the vesicle. So he's also bringing those kind of well, applications now into the clinical arena as we have done so far for the cell as well. So we have to see how, how that moves forward. Um, uh, I hope it, it's, it's successful, uh, but I think we still need a lot of improvements to, to have this in a larger populations. Um, and that's all bring to the limitation of this therapeutic use. A lot of things I, I mentioned here. I would like to highlight three, and that's the last few, few minutes I would like to use that uh, in, in this, uh, this talk. Um, I think these are the three major issues we run into for a therapeutic. So, uh, of course, who cares about the therapeutic mechanism if it just works, it works. But we have learned a lot on the cells that we just have to understand how it works because otherwise the translation will fail probably in the end as well. Um, we have to work on the standardization of EV production. Sean already mentioned a lot, and I'll show you a few things that we have seen. And I think this, this delivery and action, we have to improve it um, because just in the same way as, as the cells have done, uh, these vesicles can show these beneficial effects, but we, we have to improve that to really make a benefit in the, in the clinical setting in the end. Um, on the mechanism of, of action, um, I think uh, th this paper nicely shows that we need collaborative uh, effects, not only between labs as we're sitting here discussing a lot of things, but also with different fields. And this is a collaboration I have uh, since a few years with uh, Professor Raymond Schifflers in, in, in my department, or in, in my hospital. And he's uh, a professor in animal medicine for many, many years on drug delivery. And together with uh, one of his postdocs, also now in my group, Peter Vara, we, we see a lot of similar effects. So drug delivery with liposomes and lipo-based uh, particles has experienced similar problems and, 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 and issues as we run into now with the vesicles. But I've learned already for 20 years how to characterize them better, how to do the production better, and how to get to the mode of actions. So teaming up with those type of teams, I think, is essential to move forward. Um, and illustrated in this, this recent publication from his group is, is showing that we run into s issues that they had done already for, for this liposome-based uh, therapeutics. Like Sean already mentioned, if you use EVs and you flush the label, we have, well, it is easy to perform and it allows EV tracking, but we have artifacts. We should be careful there. Um, and it's not really suitable to show cargo delivery. As Sean mentioned, proteins we can identify, like Amprin I showed to you, that's something we can identify as a cargo that's probably involved in Micronase, a lot of people claim, but I don't think there's uh, clear evidence that micronate transfer to, to target cells showed uh, beneficial effects. Um, in the case of, of the amount of loading, if you calculate that back, it's maybe also not even expected because you only have a few micronase in a vesicle. Can that do an, a massive job in an organ that's like the heart? So it's still things we have to explore. If you want to uh, study micronase and RNA, so you bring it into your tar or your donor cells, you bring it into vesicles, you can study that, of course, um, in your, your uh, in your end cells of, of, of interest. But remind yourself, if you use SIRNAs or micronase, it doesn't only affect your micronase or your target of, of, uh, of your protein of interest. It also affects multiple other things in those cells that you use. 
So don't forget that part. So take your controls along and, and be careful. Of course, what, what uh, um, Sean already was mentioning that nowadays we see that, that this, this CRE uh, transferring is possible in cells and that I think will allow us to, to set up a different models to really study the mechanisms here and also to show, for instance, in the heart, that's where things that, that Mike Roos is busy in and in our labs as well, to get the cells out that are targeted by these kind of therapeutics and, and see what, what's going on. On the scalability, also that uh, Sean was mentioning already, um, culturing these cells, propagating them, outlink EVs, a lot of people using the identification. Uh, Sean was mentioning that from the serum didn't make any difference between size exclusion and chromatography. We've seen uh, opposite. So the amounts of vesicles were not so dramatically different. But if we use these vesicles on our target cells, in this case, endothelial cells again, and we expose them to EVs, uh, isolated by ultrasonification and, and uh, this uh, size exclusion chromatography, we clearly see that the activation signals in these cells are massively higher expressed between the sec uh, compared to the ultrasonification. So that's definitely in my lab now that we switched away from the ultrasonification step to sec. Um, but of course, we have conditions in, in our medium that are defined. So we don't have the serum problems, so we don't have the, the other uh, issues there. Another thing is what you can think of is, is not only improving your production or your isolation part, but also thinking about the production. And this is uh, new work from uh, Peter Vader and, and Ortega in, in, in our teams where they start to manipulate the donor cells where you get the vesicles from. And, and as Sean nicely showed already, is that the release of, of uh, extra vesicles, for instance, inside the cells are connected to the early endosome and early lysosome pathways. And there are inhibitors available for that to, to manipulate the internal uh, pathways. And basically by knocking down uh, the lysosomal pathways with, for instance, chloroquine or the NDRG1, you could basically block this path and thereby you hope to enhance the release of these vesicles. And of course you have to think, okay, is that for a therapeutic approach, is that a good or a bad thing? But at least in this case, we just looked whether this is possible. And what we saw is, yes, it is possible. So if you think about the different markers on the left, and based on time, I will not go all, all the details there, uh, but with NTA, you see that the release in a number of vesicles uh, is increasing up, uh, in, in these, these uh, cell types, again, these progenitor cells from the heart. And even the activation signals, again, on these endothelial cells with AKT and, and, and the phosphor is increased uh, in, 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 in a concentration way uh, by using these kind of inhibitors. Of course, we should be careful if you go into an in vivo setting. We have to test whether these are as functional as, as uh, we, we hope for. But at least gives us insights so you can manipulate the release of vesicles and thereby increase production and maybe also reduce the workload that you need for these kind of therapeutics. Um, one slide back to the cellular therapeutics. What we already know and, and uh, several people see, have seen and also what we have seen in this experiment here on the right is that basically if you inject something in the heart, in this case cells, they're immediately flushed out of the heart via, via the venous uh, drainage system. But those are micrometer-sized uh, cells. So what happens if you start infusing nanometer-sized particles or viral particles or any other therapeutic you put into the heart. So we believe, and, and we are still exploring that, because there is still some conflicting data that we saw that we also need that for vesicles, or at least not maybe for the acute moment, but at least to have a prolonged release of your therapeutics, because if you want to do something in a chronic environment in a heart, uh, one injection is probably not enough. So for those kind of reasons, we're also developing now well, different hydrogels, and this is a hydrogel published uh, a few years back from the Technical University Eindhoven, which is basically a, a gel that has uh, pack blocks and different uh, polymers side chains, uh, and which allows it uh, to be a pH switchable gel. So I've got all the details here, but at the pH neutral, it's a hydrogel, and if you higher the pH, it's a liquid. So that allows us to inject it via a catheter into the myocardial environment, and there, pH is seven, it becomes a gel. So what we did is we infused here, uh, or we mixed in our, our vesicles, and we could show that, that these vesicles are slowly released from these particles. And of course, this is just one of the hydrogels. You can use multiple others as well. Um, but at least what we could see is that within one week or two weeks after the release, these vesicles are stable in a, just an, a regular culture dish without target cells, but just the vesicles in a biomaterial, and can still activate as I've show, showed you before. So these are relatively stable in a gel and can release their, their therapeutic uh, uh, well, benefits. Uh. So with that, oh, and one, one example that we can do that still in, in large animal models. So we can infuse these kind of hydrogels into a portion animal model and uh, visualize then our pKH labeled uh, uh, vesicles in, inside this gel. Of course, it's really packed, so it's a way to, to visualize that. 
and with that I would like to to stop. Um, I think the, this vesicle field is, is, is booming and this is really exciting. And it might be that these, these vesicles might be, have similar effects as, as our cells in, in the uh, skin reperfusion injury, as Sean mentioned, and also in the regenerative therapies in the end. Um, but I think what we have to go for is improved standardization methods. We need to slow delivery systems. And I think in the end, what we also run into is that we have to empower these vesicles more to really get therapeutic beneficial effects. So we'll learn a lot, but probably in the end, we have to add more micronations, more proteins that we're interested in, or maybe use this endogenous communication methods to understand how we can deliver these therapeutics to the cell, because that's what we know from the nanomedicine field with the liposomes. They get into the cells, but 99.9% .9 of the therapeutics end up into the lysosomes. So we can learn from this biology a lot, how to get therapeutics on, on the right side in the cell. So. And with that, I would like to acknowledge a lot of the people from the data I've shown you. So from the Marco Vauba group, doing the facts analysis and detailed analysis on the vesicles, Raymond Schifferis and Peter Vader from uh, the Nanomedicine group, and the Leiden University and uh, Technical University in Eindhoven for, for a lot of collaborative approach in this. But in the end, of course, also just my own team, and I highlight here the several people working here in, in dark on this area. You, you need a lot of team effort and a lot of laborious hours in, 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 in the lab to, to get to these data sets because it's an uh, intense field, let's put it that way. And with that, we'd like to stop and take any questions uh, when they're there. Thank you so much. So it's a field that is growing and there's a lot of potential. Let's see. Uh, questions from the audience? I, right. Come on. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I have a question correlated with the first part of the talk. So when there's, um, I think you show the data when you have like the biomarker from the microRNA release for, from the patients, but I, I saw there is like a follow up after three and a half hour. I don't know if you have any data about like, how stable that microRNA after long term. So you mean the PCR data that you saw that there is a drop after so many hours, but that drop, that's basically the increase in expression. Eh? So a drop in the CT values means that there's a higher expression. So then it suddenly becomes present in circulation. And we saw that, that at least for days it's present. We didn't fully really follow up in weeks or months. Uh, there are people, of course, doing this kind of work in, for instance, heart failure, where you hope that these kind of markers are expressed and you can monitor that. But it, uh, the small study showed some micronase that could predict that, but I haven't seen a lot of big data sets with, with large patient populations to, to do that in that way. I think that's still lacking in this field. Uh, can I, can I have and the other question is, I, I be, I'm, I'm just curious a bit, like, what is the correlation between those and they, like, which kind of a pathway they regulate? Maybe they have some overlap between them, or it's just like a spontaneous response for the, I mean, for the chest pain of the patients, and then it went out, it's nothing correlated with that kind of, like, patients. I, I tried to understand your question, so. I don't, because there is a lot of microRNA has been reported, I mean, on that paper, and then I just curious, like, it's just like a spontaneous response between those RNAs, or it's like something overlap between the regulation pathway of those microRNAs, so. Uh, good question, I don't think we have an answer. Um, if you think about the microRNAs, also what I showed you, and also what others have shown, there are reports, for instance, on the deal cells that if these micronates get in there, that they behave differently. So I think that part is, is shown, um, but not in a patient environment, I think, and also not comparing multiple things from different patient groups. That's, uh, I haven't seen that. Yeah. One more question over there. Mean, meanwhile, I will also like a question, because if, if we want to implement this the use of uh, vesicles of microvesicles, whatever. Uh, within the therapeutic setting, we need as a off the shelf product, we need to overscale the production. And for us in our lab it takes ages to have enough amount to infuse in one single pay. So yep. how can how can you envision this? Because well, I think there are two or probably more than two aspects here. So one, I think, is the use of bioreactors. There are a lot of people uh, in the nanomedicine field and the production of proteins, uh, transgenic, uh, sorry, uh, recombinant proteins, a lot of experience is there to use bioreactors to do that. Um, and with cells, we also can do that already. So we're now developing that as well and to test whether we can uh, well, isolate vesicles from big batches of cells just in these incubators and, and, and what is the functional benefit there. Uh, I think that that's, that's one side that I think it still has to, to improve. And of course, off the shelf means as well that we can store it somewhere. Um, so 
somehow we're not sure why that is, but if you look at these vesicles, we can store them for, for days, a week, in, in, in four degrees. Um, we also do now experiments where we just freeze them on minus 20, minus 80, and we can still see that they have beneficial effects in culture dishes. So it seems that we can, well, store them, and then it can be an off-the-shelf therapeutic. So I think combination of those will, will be needed. Uh. Hi, really nice talk. I wanted to ask you if uh, we can use uh, pardon my ignorance if I don't know it, but uh, oh, no, if, we can, if we can use uh, uh, extracellular vesicles from normal people and uh, if they express ion channels also and if they can be, these things can be put to channelopathies, for example, with uh, uh, trafficking defects or uh, if there are a lower expression of ion channels on the surface, if that can be actually a therapy at some point, what's your opinion? Um, in, in the direct way as you explained it now or asked it now, I would say it will never work, to be honest. Um, because of, well, if you bring in these kind of proteins, that's basically what you do then. Um, of course, stability and, and, and degradation time will, will take them away if they are taken up anyway. So, but I think a lot of people also, including us, are working now on uh, making, well, more, more an, 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 uh, genetic therapeutic from these kind of devices. And thereby you can do it, I think. Um, but of course, you have to prove that still. Um, but then you bring in, well, or a uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 based therapeutics or adenoviral approach that we have now but more on this endogenous machinery um, those kind of things I think will be feasible in its future but not in a simple way just take a normal cell and, and, and show the effect probably if you look at the acute setting in a cellular environment it will work but that has probably a different aspect than bringing in the protein on a stable long run okay and the last question uh, would be with, um we have been learning these days that the use of um, um, autologous stem cells will carry all the comorbidities associated, they will be dysfunctional and so forth. So the best way is to use allogenic stem cells. So um, you have talked about efficacy over time, mechanisms, but what, are, what about safety? Well, safety, that's also in, in the slides there. Oh, but it's, it's, then, sorry. Yeah, but it's just in the, because you have to select okay, a few I'll of the safety. items. <laughs> I think safety is still is also an issue in a sense. Uh, if you think about off-the-shelf therapeutics, uh, you have to be sure that you can use these kind of therapeutics uh, for all patients. Um, and a lot of people in, in, in the cardiovascular area claim then that uh, extra vesicles are uh, immune privileged, like we know for the MSCs or the, some of the cell types. Um, what we have seen in our in vitro assays that we can do immune suppression in, in, in our cell cultures. Um, but we've also seen that a few of the proteins that could stimulate the immune response are also sometimes present on the vesicle, so we should be careful there. Mm -hmm. And maybe not with a single infusion, but if you do it multiple yeah, times, you yeah, probably have a response of the patient, so we should be careful there. Yeah. So with this, thank you very much, and we close the session.